Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Constructive Criticism. I am your host, Spencer, and I am joined by my co-host, the newest member of Team Lingering Souls, Michael Hinderocker. Oh, it's such a nice introduction. I really thought I was going to get thrown under the bus here. I thought we were going to jump right into my I, accidental I, dream crushing. I am not even going to talk about it. If you want to talk Wonderful. about it later, you're welcome sure, to do that. Sure, sure, sure. Do you, man. <laughs> Uh, you know, you know who won't dream crush you like Michael Hinderocker, though, is our sponsor. You can check them out at Oasis uh... You can MTGOasis.com. You can get 15% off of your order, dream crushing the competition, uh, <laughs> <laughs> using the code CCMTG at checkout. And you can get 4% off of every order using the code Would That Be Good? No spaces. Um, we really appreciate Oasis Games. They make it possible for us to play the magic that we want to play, and they mean the world to us. You can also check out our other sponsor at uh, the Mana Base and Fusion Gaming. We are in works right now. Uh, they're actually offering us tons of stuff, including an updated overlay, things like that. Fusion and uh, the Mana Base are being very kind to us, and we really appreciate them. Uh, their new their new producer, things like that. Uh, it's it's becoming a great relationship. We really appreciate them. If you're looking for sealed product, things like that. Fusion Gaming has it where Oasis Game doesn't. Check them out, FusionGaming.com. Um, Muffin Button, that's a great name, uh, in our chat says he just ordered from them and it seems great. So check out Fusion Gaming and Oasis Games. They are both amazing places, uh, as well as the Mana Base, the content producer of Fusion Gaming. Um, it, it's, it's really cool to have such great sponsors. I'm very picky with our sponsors and they both mean the world to us, so check them out. You can also check out the rest of the network um, right now. I'm sad to announce that uh, Common Knowledge is probably gone until, I'm going to be honest, it's probably until this is my full-time job, and uh, like that doesn't happen until our patron hits quite a few dollars, um, and then I will probably become the host of that show. Um, Kyle decided that school was really important to him right now, which is completely reasonable. Um, I, I still want a popper podcast on our network. We're in contact with another podcast to join our network and uh but but for right now common knowledge is completely off the off the market and you know what i think that i think that to be honest like mason does so much for this network that i like when he offered to host that show i i was honestly worried because like it, it is so hard to do what we do and what mason does that Mason doing three shows, like there's a reason I don't do common knowledge, and it's because it's it's too much. And uh, while I appreciate Mason giving that a try, I appreciate Manny and all he's done for this network, and I appreciate Kyle giving it a try. I think that common knowledge will come back when it's time to come back, but right now it's it's time to go. But limited time only is going strong. Um, we're really hitting our stride with Danny, and I am really happy with it. So check out that podcast. Uh, limited time only is here, MTG Cast, and on YouTube every week. Um, and, and it's, it's become a really fun show and, uh, you know, having Mason do the stuff that he does for constructive criticism and limited time only is, has made these shows better and we really appreciate it. So thank you so much to Mason. Um, and you can check out limited time only. Um, yeah, I, I just, I want to say that as well, that Mason is a huge help and has made, I think, taken a lot of stress off of Spencer with, regards to the show and <laughs> that's so true and just has has done a lot of work that he certainly didn't have to do and that just just really really awesome guy yeah we really appreciate him uh doing all this behind the scenes uh it, it's i i love this network like i love what limited time only common knowledge and constructive criticism and uh, back when we had it, Hardcast stood for. And, you know, as we add shows, as we add content, I continue to want it to be about the same thing, which is improving the players listening and being a good part of the community. So thank you so much to Mason. Uh, thank you so much to the, uh, for all of that. It, it means the world to me. Um, so no Patreons this week. Uh, we Every week on the show, we give a shout out to our newest Patreons. Um, None this week, but, you know, we're, we're staying pretty steady right now, and it, it's pretty cool. Uh, you know, being able to pay for my GP this week, my GP in two weeks, um, paying Michael's entry fees as I promised him right now is something that has always kind of been a dream, right? Like being able to go to more Grand Prix is something that I want. 
with a kid, with a wife, with a full-time job. It, I couldn't do it without the patrons. Um, and, you know, giving Michael that little bit of an edge, uh, making and, them... and And just the encouragement, just, uh, yeah. just the yeah. idea that you're happy with content and that, I mean, that's what we're trying to do, right? We're yeah. trying to provide a service to you and I hope that you feel like you're getting yeah. a fair shake on that end. That's, that's the goal. Yeah, one of the things that really stuck out to me this weekend, um, I, I mean, Michael and I, the number of people at Grand Prix Phoenix that came up to me was more than ever before. You know, GP, GP Portland last year, we had talked about how crazy There were a it lot was. there. And GP Phoenix probably doubled that. It was, it was crazy. Uh, both, uh, even weirder than just constructive criticism, both myself and Danny played against our round one opponents at this Grand Prix, and they recognized us as limited time only hosts. And limited time only misses so many weeks and has been on and off for like three years <laughs> that, uh, you know, we, I know that we're hitting our stride on that show, but it is crazy to see the amount of support that we're getting on this network that we're doing these shows and this, this, it was amazing to see, to be a part of. Um, and uh, Michael and I have said this before, uh, both of us, but when you come up to us at a Grand Prix, please just like say hi, introduce yourself. We are very happy to meet you. It is, it is not awkward for us unless you make it awkward. So please just like, I mean, I'm kind Introduce of an awkward yourself. person, so like, <laughs> if it's awkward, it's probably my fault. Don't feel bad, you know. Just say hey. But we're, but what I am nice saying enough, is that is that I truly believe that uh, Michael and I are and Danny like we love meeting the listeners. Um, so don't feel scared to come up to us. It's much more awkward if you stare us down than if you just say, "Hey, are you Michael or Spencer?" That's like completely reasonable um i i understand that it could be awkward if it's not us but like it's it's way better for us to be able to like introduce i mean i met so many people uh i met gavin i met uh oh man i'm gonna mess up so many names this is the thing is bef i used to but, write down the names of my phone on gps yeah. and i didn't do it this week and i feel so stupid i was talking really to danny about it and danny was like it was funny because Danny was like, I wish that I wrote down the listeners that I met this week because, like... Yeah, it, names are tough for pretty much everyone so, in that kind of setting. Um, exactly. But I just want you to know how much we appreciate you listening. We talk so much about how much we appreciate the patrons of the show. But the truth is, like, when we go to these events and we see all these people that maybe aren't in our Facebook group, maybe aren't in our Discord, maybe aren't patrons of the show... But they're still listening every week. We had somebody come up to us and tell us that he'd been listening since episode two of Constructed Criticism. And like – Did you want to apologize to him? A little bit. Yeah. I, yeah. I didn't exactly know what to say um, because the show's evolved so much. But like it's that kind of dedication and those kind of fans <laughs> that just mean the world to me. And I, I don't – I hope that you know that when you come up to me at a Grand Prix or at an, you know whatever event we're at – or wherever you see me, I've had people come up to me at a at a co uh, cafe Rio before, and like it doesn't matter where we are. It it actually does mean the world to me that those moments happen, and that you that I, I've made an impact on your life. Um, and this is kind of so. Gavin uh, it was a player that made a huge impact on me this week, and I'll probably do a video about this. But he talked about uh, his first interaction with me which was at a, the Sunday Super Series qualifier at Grand Prix Portland years ago. And what had happened is the, the uh, Super Series wasn't using the audio speakers of the event center. They were just posting parries and expecting people to sit down. So we we're both in a win and in for top eight of the Sunday Super Series event. And Gavin's like maybe 15 seconds late for the start of the round. And my, the judge comes up and tries to give him a game loss. And I had told the judge, I was like, listen, like you aren't announcing pairings very well. This guy was clearly running to the table. 
I, I don't accept this game loss. Will you please just let us play our match? And it made a huge impact on Gavin. Uh, and I hope that when you listen to this show, that you understand that like the edges to be gained are not the tiny, minute kind of BS edges that like so many spikes try to gain. And they're actually in like deck selection, playing thoroughly, and the kind of things that Michael and I preach. Um, and it, it meant a lot to me that that stuck out to Gavin to the point where he like wanted to hang out with me this weekend. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that ultimately, like, all we're trying to do is get better, and hopefully our trying to get better helps you get better, and yes. that's cool. I mean, that's, it, it's a, that's, I think that's fun for everyone, right? It's, it's fun to try to improve. Let's actually go into that a little bit, Michael. So our first segment on the show is hashtag always improving. We try and talk about what we can do every week to improve ourselves, um, because magic's tough, like, right? Like, you know, while we don't want free wins for you know, not using the audio speakers to announce rounds. What we do want is wins because we're trying to get better and, and trying to improve, and Magic is really tough. Uh, you know, I know that you unfortunately took 17th place at a GP, losing out on a lot of money this weekend. Honestly, uh, it, you know, it doesn't really bother me that much. It's Magic is just not a game you're probably going to ever make a lot of money playing. Sure. And but, but what, I came what, out well ahead on the weekend. It's all good. Oh, yeah. What do you think your moment was of improving this weekend? Um, so I'd been kind of struggling with this draft format, and I was watching a stream of another guy who's queued for this PT drafting, and he was also struggling. And some dude came into his Twitch chat who has, like, 70 competitive league trophies. Oh, wow. And was like, hey, I think you're drafting wrong. I think you should really listen – to, or you should like read this content or listen to this information. And I just clicked on the link and closed the stream because, you know, I was trying to find someone who was maybe having more success than I was and then sort of stumbled into someone who was having way more success than I was. Some guy with, you know, 70 single limb trophies is like, that's impressive. Like at that point, just through sheer volume, you have to know more than I do. And their idea with this format was basically that removal spells aren't actually good. And that you should just be trying to take two drops, auras, and pirate scutlasses, basically. Yeah, I, you know, this is something that, for me, was, like, a huge part of this Grand Prix. And and obviously, like, I, I think that always improving is, like, the moment of constructed criticism where we get to talk a little bit outside of constructed and just, like, in yeah, general. Yeah, yeah. And but I, I think that, I think that for me, and when I, like, looked at my seal pool, I instantly knew how bad my pool was. And the reason for that is, like, the importance of two drops in a format that cares about playing to the board is huge. And my, my pool had no two drops. And I think that in draft itself, like, I talked about on Limited Time only last week, taking vanguards over removal spells. Because so playing your I, best yeah. two drop is so much more important than whatever crappy removal spells so you get. So I went a step further than that. I first picked one with the wind over lightning strike, which I will tell you feels the most wrong, but I am convinced is correct. One, the reason being, if your opponent has auras, it is so hard to hold up lightning strike to actually blow them out. And because, because you must, have to play to the board. Right, exactly. So you end up trading two for two anyways, in that you block and then lightning strike, except they're way ahead in tempo because you had to sit back and hold up lightning strike. And I'm pretty convinced that basically dive down is <laughs> dive down is more or less the only non RS spell I would like to play. So can we talk really quick about how do you apply this kind of learning? So for constructed criticism, obviously, we have constructed listeners. How do you apply this out to magic in general? So I think this, for me, it's like a, a moment where I am more interested in learning than I am in being right. And if someone who has had a lot more success than me says removal spells are bad, even the good ones, and auras are great, and your brain is screaming no, 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 sometimes you just have to like kind of take that leap of faith and say... 
I I think I've learned something. We're going to see how true it is. And that happens in Constructed, too. You might think a matchup plays out differently. You might have someone who you respect tell you a matchup is different than it is. You might, you know, just trying to learn, trying to learn rather than prove your own point, basically, was what I took away from that as a broader okay. concept. You know, this is something that I think that everyone struggles with, right? Because you have preconceived notions. You have things that you're like, eh, well, like, I don't think what this person thinks. So clearly they can't be right. And too often we fall into basically what is a trap of that. And what we really need to be doing is, even if you don't agree in the end, find out why they think what they think. Exactly. Exactly. Because not even if someone's smarter than you, you you can have an idea that's better than them. That's that's fine and it happens. Or something works for you and not for them. But I think saying, okay, well, you've been really successful at this. I'm gonna trust your judgment until it's proven wrong. Right? I mean I I think that just fundamentally I was I was happy I was happy that I let go of my preconceptions and got rewarded for it. Yeah, I'm I'm really happy. Uh, it, it's funny because there were a few moments in this Grand Prix that, uh, to be honest, like on MTGO and through PPTQs, I've had a lot of success in this format. And, you know, when I looked at Danny's original sealed deck and when I – when you talked to me about first picking one with the wins, you know, it felt wrong to me. And I was very happy to be in a position that – to be wrong. And the reason that you should be in a happy in a position to be wrong is that it means that it's a learning opportunity for you. It means you're not capped, right? It means exactly. that like, what it, wherever you're at now, we can get better. I agree. Yeah. I agree. You always have that opportunity to improve. And for me, for always improving this week, it was very much doing everything within your power. You know, I tried – so many different versions of my sealed pool. Um, I've I tested standard. I was willing to, you know, pay some extra money to make sure my cyborg was correct for my PTQ. And honestly, I just I want to be in a position where it's like, all right, is this a reasonable thing for me to try? Is this a reasonable thing for me to spend an amount of time on? Whether it's building my sealed pool seventeen different ways, seventeen different times, or making sure that my sideboard and my deck is overall correct you know i went out and i like searched down human beings for vizier of the many faces for the ptq on sunday because i knew that it was correct to play vizier of the many faces at the ptq and i i think that too often we like give up too soon on different things whether it's our sealed pools our constructed decks our sideboards and just I mean, we'll get into it later, but kind of get comfortable in whatever we're thinking or whatever we're doing. And I want to always be willing to do as much as I can, no matter what it is. I think that's a great I, – I, I like that just as an attitude, right? That, like, I'm not going – basically, I'm not going to go halfway, right? Like, I'm not going to go all the way to a Grand Prix and look at my sealed pool and just – not try to win the most games I can with it, no matter how good or bad it is, right? Exactly. Like whether you have double Aether Sphere Harvester or no two drops, it, no, especially in limited, it's never unwinnable. You, you there. That's if, my if you thought do, too. If you build had your I best got, deck, you always exactly. have a chance. You have a chance. Exactly. If I had gotten a little bit lucky, I easily right. could have dated this GP. Exactly. Despite and, your pool being bad, you can be like, yeah. well, I'm going to build the best version of this deck. And I think that just like your point about like avoiding self sabotage when it when you're just kind of giving up halfway. Yeah. So we're going to take a quick break, really quick, and we'll be right back with our deck doctor segment of the show.
So let's go on to our Deck Doctor segment of the show. And every week on the show, we invite patrons of $5 or more to submit a deck list and have us talk about the things that we'd love, the things that we change, and the, where we think that the deck currently stands in the metagame. And luckily for us, one of our patrons is Andrew Elliott, who loves our favorite deck, Michael. Our very, very favorite deck. So, to be fair, as far as Eldrazi Tron goes, I, I'm into this. Let's, so let's, let's, let's hear. Uh, yeah. So, you are our designated uh, reader of our dog decker, deck doctor. Sorry. That was. And now we see why I'm the reader. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, why don't you talk <laughs> about the things that he said as well as his deck list. Yeah, absolutely. So Andrew's deck list is four Chalice of the Void, two Relic of Progenitus, four Expedition Map, two Warping Whale, two Dismember, four Matter Reshaper, Thought Not Seer, and Reality Smasher, one Worm Coil Engine, three Endbringer, four Walking Ballista, 12 Tron Lands, two All Is Dust, two Cavern of Souls, four Eldrazi Temple, two Wastes, three Ghost Quarter, a Seagate Wreckage, and his sideboard is three Hangerback Walker, two Graft Digger's Cage, one Relic of Progenitus, one Basilisk Collar, two Ratchet Bomb, two Sorceress Spot Glass, one Warping Whale, two Witchbane Orb, and one Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hunger. And Andrew says his key differences are, this is a take on Andre Skrowski's list, where he advocated for zero card due to the fact of uh, Eldrazi Tron being more so a Karn Tron deck, and he didn't like that. Like, he felt like it took away from what the deck was trying to do. Uh, Warping Whales in the main have been great versus Affinity, Storm, Titan Shift, Countering an Hour, Escape Shift, or Removing Problematic Creatures. Um it says the- which Bane Orb is for Storm and Adnaz. He likes Sorceress Spyglass over Needle uh, just because you're less likely to whiff, but also because you can play with a Chalice of the Void on one in play. So, I, I'm i looking at this deck list, and I'm, I'll just go first. So, go for it. So, we all, we, the first thing we do is like to talk about things that we love. I like that this is a very true Eldrazi deck. This is not mincing what it's trying to do. It's got a very clear game plan, and I do appreciate that. Michael? Uh, Yeah, absolutely. I love cutting Karn. I think Eldrazi Tron is, like, one of the worst Karn decks of all time. You're just really bad at actually... It's that Karn in Eldrazi Tron is shockingly close to Scour from Existence. VFZ draft all-star like it it is mostly a seven mana vindicate it's just not good you almost never hit seven three you it just is just a horrible card all is dust on the other hand in any matchup but the mirror is plague wind it's also an eldrazi spell so your eldrazi temples can help cast it so it like only kind of costs seven so you can actually cast it in a game where you don't assemble Tron and Karn pretty much never happens. So I, I, there are a lot of things I like. Yeah. I, I think that I agree with that. I think that one of the problems that you and I have always had with Eldrazi Tron is it's mixed categories, right? Is this a Karn deck or is it not a Karn deck? I feel like ne- right. nobody ever figures it out. And I think that we both like that this has picked a lane, which a lot of them have been in the past. One of the things that we like so much about that modern deck, I don't know if it was last week or the week yeah, before, yeah. The, the, the green mono one. green deck, is that it picked a lane. It was like, this is what I'm doing. And I think that that is so important. One of the things that I think that when I look at this deck that I I don't know that I would change, but I'm a little bit worried about, I don't think there's enough worm coil engines in the main of this deck. That might be true. You like more. So the, my one issue with Wormcoil is that, again, because you can't cast it with Eldrazi Temple and our only piece of acceleration in the main deck is Warping Whale, it's really a card that's difficult to cast. That like, could be true, against... but the reason... So I, I understand that, and I have a counterpoint to my own point. Sure. If, so If I don't have Wormcoil Engine, I want another card that brings me back from behind And I don't think that Endbringer actually does that. So what I would rather have is maybe something like an Ulamog or something. I don't know what other color spell brings me back, but I don't, I feel like I want not three Endbringers. And that number really bugs me. 
I actually like Endbringer pretty well. I might even play the fourth. I don't think Wormcoil is great in this deck because I do think you're pretty poor at getting Tron. I always, I, it's kind of fallen out of favor, but I really like Simeon Spirit Guide in the main deck of this deck. Um, and that's can, something. Can we rewind I, a little bit? What, yeah. So when you look at when you look at Andrew's list, you said you might play the fourth Endbringer. What matchups that Andrew? So like. One of the things that I really like that Limited Resources did is they brought the Quadrant Theory into Magic. And I think that it actually applies in Constructed as well as Limited. So in matchup, but I think that it's a little bit different, right? So you have matchups that you're favored in, matchups that you're not favored in, um, uh, and matchups that you're even in, and then unwinnables. And I, I would like to understand where Endbringer sits in those type of matchups. So I think Endbringer is really good in a lot of the mid-rangey matchups where it's pretty draw dependent. Like are, matchups are you, where your chalices are, you are favored in general in those matchups. So you're favored, but you're also favored largely because of Endbringer. Okay, talk Endbringer about that. Is, so I mean, if you're playing against another creature deck, Endbringer is just a beating. It can't get fatal pushed. Uh, I mean, sometimes Abzan is going to have path or whatever, but you might have chalice it mows down lingering soul tokens it if you are slightly behind it pulls you way ahead in a hurry it's just an extremely powerful card and again it's something that you can cast if you get early tron but it's also something that if like you happen to draw a double eldrazi temple you can still sometimes cast really early it, it's just it's flexible it it does a lot of different things and the only times that it is really bad are when you are so far behind that you probably need all this dust specifically. Okay. What are the, where do you think this deck stands today? I mean, I think the biggest problem with this deck in general is that because you're straight colorless, your sideboard is pretty awful. Um, you just don't have a lot of, like, you're probably better in game one than you are after sideboarding almost as a, just as a straight up rule. Um, and I, I think that that's kind of a problem. Uh, I think your storm matchup is favored, and that is a good place to be right now. Why do you think that? Um, you have a lot of disruptive pieces, and you also apply a pretty quick clock. So is that is that like Chalice of the Void Relic plus Thought Not Seer? Chalice Relic Thought Not Seer and uh, Warping Whale and Dismember are both quite good in that matchup as well. Um, then after boarding, you get more relics, cages, uh, potentially another warping whale, and the witch bane orbs. Like in the in the boarded games, you both have kind of broken Eldrazi draws and sort of stacks or mud style draws where you just like play out a bunch of lock pieces in the first couple of turns. And I think it requires your opponent to have a pretty good hand. Like you'll lose the games where they have their best hands, but anytime they don't have their very best hands, they're going to struggle. So you actually kind of actually just hit on the thing that I actually really like about this deck and where I think it stands. I think that this deck has evolved into what it always should have been, which is the mud deck of the format. Tron is like a big mana deck, right? This thing that like is this like big mana, not exactly a ramp deck, but kind of fills a similar role. Whereas I think this deck is like a mud deck, which is like this bigger mana control deck that controls from a different access, which is must throw answers, a little bit of disruption. Um, and, and I do like that in this style of deck, rather than trying to go the other direction where you're trying to fit in things that don't really belong in your deck, which Michael kind of hit in at with Karn. Yeah, I, I just think when you push in that direction, you don't have quite, like, just Expedition Map isn't quite enough. An expedition map works in this style because it helps find like Cavern of Souls or Ghost Quarters. Like it has just enough utility in addition exactly. to making a bunch of mana that it's like an acceptable magic card. But I think when you really go the Tron direction and if you want to play Karn, I would just play a better Karn deck. Because they do exist. The, the actual Tron deck is a great Karn deck. Let's let's go on to our next segment, which is our power rankings. So thank you so much to Andrew for submitting that. I hope that we gave you our thoughts. I do think that this deck is actually short on Ulamogs. Like when I look at this deck, I think that I, I would want more. I know that Michael says he would want more Endbreakers. Um, 
it, it's rough to build a sideboard for these kind of decks, and I think we both agree on that. I, I like Ulamog in the sideboard. I can imagine matchups where it's good, but much like Karn, it's not a card that I really want in game one, I don't think. Just too many times it's going to be dead. All right. Let's go on to our power rankings. So every week on the show, we talk about a specific format. And uh, the only tournament this weekend in Constructed, I believe, was a Legacy Open. And as we just talked about Legacy, we don't want to talk about that. So we're going to talk, we're going to prep for the Pro Tour that Michael's going to, that Danny's going to, um, by talking about the decks that are doing well on MPGO right now. Um, so one of the things that I, I think is important is to know the difference for our listeners between MTGOstats.com and MTGGoldfish.com. So MTGO Stats only takes magic online results so we're going to use that this week when we look at our decks so i think they turn it over just a little bit faster too they do they do yep so it's it's a snapshot of like i think is it it's it, it's like the weeks? last two weeks only yeah. and it's yeah, only magic weeks. online so it's like it it can be a little bit weird to look at eternal formats but it's pretty valuable for, for standard yeah. standard specifically i think I agree. So, let us look at number five. So, coming in at number five, we have Mardu Vehicles. Um, so, I, I've actually talked a lot of, to a lot of people who have tried this deck. Um, and it sounds like there's a pretty clear consensus on this. And, Michael, I know that you've tried this deck going into this Pro Tour. So, I know a ton of people who have tried this deck. So, Mardu Vehicles, the reason to play it is they believe that it has a very good teamer matchup. But my common consensus that I'm getting is... You actually don't need the white cards, and a lot of people would rather just play black red, uh, play black red aggro, uh, and and still keep that good teamer matchup without having the three color mana base, which is really hard to achieve in this format. Michael, uh, testing with the Pro Tour, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think the mana is a little bit tricky to make work right, um, and it's hard to get your artifact count quite high enough. Uh, one one of the things that I see in this deck is that to turn on on license and your Spire of Industries and your Toolcraft Exemplars, you have to play some artifacts you kind of don't want to play. So I don't think like PNLR is really the three drop that you'd like right now, but you're forced into playing it because she produces an artifact. Uh, the Bomac Couriers are pretty bad in this deck, but again, you're forced into playing them because they're artifacts. And I think in general, like there's just, there's a real cost to playing the amount of artifacts you need. Scrap Heap Scrounger is really the only one along with Heart Big of Cure. Probably, probably just those two. Those are the only two that you're like excited about. And everything else is kind of like a... It's basically how far are you willing to go to play Toolcraft Exemplar? That's basically the question. And, and I think that when you think about things like... Uh, you know, I, I lost to a Black Red Artifact Aggro deck this week. And, and I think that the truth is, is that Heart of Cairn is the truth. Scrap Heap Scrounger is the truth. And it's about playing the correct things outside of that. And I don't actually know that Toolcraft Exemplar, Veteran Motorist, and Apollo give you a reason to play white at this point. And that maybe... And they, they just make your mana kind of clunky. They're so they, bad. You can just say bad. Yeah, the, the mana is awkward. Really, if if like... If the mana was slightly better, I think this deck would be very, very good. I do too. And that's because of the power, though, I think of in License Disintegration, Scrap Heap Stranger, and Heart of Kirin. Well, and Toolcraft Exemplar is obviously insane if you can actually play it, it on yes. curve. Yep. It just, it's that it doesn't necessarily age that well. And if we're not able to play it until turn two or three sometimes, it really loses a lot of its luster. So I think compared to like Mardu of old, this deck has some issues, but. I still wouldn't rule out someone figuring out a way to make the artifact count happen for them. It's it feels close. Yeah. So uh, let's let's actually go on to our number four deck because I think that we both have tried at, like I actually tried this deck on Cockatrice. Uh, I even had most of it on MTGO, so I played a. I, I actually didn't play a league with it just because. I didn't I, I didn't like the way that the deck looked. I had Chandra's um also and I think I had Gideon. Have you do you think this deck is lacking planeswalkers before we move on? So the biggest problem is that it's really difficult 
to... So basically, Hazoret is your Planeswalker. The, the problem is that Gideon is mostly uncastable. You just can't support white-white on two with if you aren't building it as a red-white this, deck, basically. This actually was a problem that I had, so I'm glad that you brought that up. Yes, yeah, so you just can't cast Gideon, so I don't really know whether he's good or not because I don't think he's a card you can legitimately consider once you start laying out the mana base. Um, and I think Chandra just competes a little too much with Hazoret. Like, that you're just capped on the number of fours you can play. Do you think that it's possible that the deck, instead of, like, maybe it's just, before we move on, uh, also, shout out to Jacob Tilk, who is the person that took second with this deck at the SCG, listener of the podcast, friend of Ryan, one of our biggest listeners, but do you think that it's possible that maybe you play, like, a, a red-white deck, kind of like this, only, like, one of the things that Jacob has going for him, or J maybe his, uh, I think he goes by Jake, but that Jake has going by him is his only black things are actually scrap heap and uh, yeah. unlicensed. And that's, and that's true even in the sideboard. There are yeah. no black cards in the sideboard. What if, what if you try and play something like maybe a one of or a two of in the total 75 uh, boats? Does that make this more interesting to you? Maybe. The The real problem is that as just, I, I feel like in general, this deck has be, has become more aggressively slanted. And the, the biggest problem is that there's a lot of tension between Bomat Courier and uh, adding like more expensive and better artifacts to the deck. Like, I think in general, one of the issues I have with Jake's list specifically is the Bonat Courier Toolcraft Exemplar 24 land. Um, and is that too many for you? It's it's just it's just tricky. It 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 creates tension, and you have really powerful draws. But the Bonat Courier is really bad in this deck. Bonat Courier is like actually well, he just does horrible. he does have Ether Spheres. Right. So you have two Aether Sphere Harvesters. But it's still a terrible one drop. But how else do you turn? Like, what other artifact can you reason? Like, I, no, this, this, this is this is this is the point. Advocate. This is the right. point. It's it's the whole problem with playing white is that you have to include something for your right. toolcraft. Yeah. Whereas, as if if you were red white, right, or or red red black specifically, which is why I think we both kind of have moved towards that version of the deck. Yes, I, I think that's version. You've seen that in the in the online metagame as well. A, a big shift towards kind of almost mono black with ha it's like mono black with Hazaret. Yeah. Um, you don't have that problem. Yeah, Magic Pancake. We we just we talked about this a couple of minutes ago. I just don't think you can you can't cast Gideon. You just can't cast it. Which makes it harder to justify white. So let's let's go on to our next deck, uh, which I believe is Esper Gifts. And I have a real problem with this deck, and I kind of want to talk about it. Michael, I feel like this deck has an identity crisis. I, I, yeah, I do too. I hate this deck. So, why don't you go first? The Silver Pro, let, let's have you lead this conversation. We <laughs> oh, that's so much pressure. Um, I think ultimately, this deck is very reliant on nothing going wrong. Basically... If uh, if you are just completely uninterrupted and you just get to do whatever you want, you are doing some pretty powerful things. But you have a bunch of stuff that like you really only want to discard, and you need all your engine pieces to like line up and come in the right order, or it doesn't. You just actually don't cast spells. Yeah. So when I envision like a deck like this existing in this format, it was like fully behind Charter Course. Um, because it means that you have to, you don't have to play red to play this style of deck. And one of the problems that I have when I look at these style of decks is they started that way and then they slowly started trimming Charter Courses. And what I'm worried about is like, that. so first of all, this deck isn't actually good with Charter Course. So when right, I envisioned so, it, it was like a charter course deck. 
But I think that people realize what I should have realized, which is none of my creatures are actually good at attacking. Um, so Chart, of course, is is just slightly better than Tormenting Voice. Well, I think it's actually quite a lot better still, because as you get down to Then why are they cards, cutting them? Well, because... So I think the main thing is that people have chosen to play a Gate to the Afterlife deck, not a God Pharaoh's Gift deck, and I think that's a subtle but important difference. We're playing zero copies of Refurbish, zero copies of Cataclysmic Gear Hulk. We're not playing anything like that anymore. So everything is but set up with the intention. If like a Scarab God deck or a Champion of Wits deck, I would still think that I would want Charter Courses. Maybe, but I think that when the only way you're actually getting this active is to get, like, it's six creatures in your graveyard, it's... Charter Course just doesn't put enough in your graveyard. Like, if... if So if you play Refurbish instead, yeah. you specifically need to put one card in your graveyard. Right. Right? When and you so don't play Refurbish, card one is very powerful. Right, and when you agree. yeah, as soon I as you start, of, as soon as yeah, as soon as you start cutting Refurbish, Charter Course is just kind of mopey, right? Like yes. you draw cards, but your cards aren't really good. You yes. want to discard them, but you need to discard more than one at a time. Yep, I completely agree with you. I was kind of trying to play devil's advocate there, but I think that this list, these decks, and I, I think that the reason that so many people don't see this in their paper meta game is that. It just kind of loses a lot of its luster as you kind of move on. Yeah, um, I think there was a list from the PTQ that was playing Refurbish. So if you're interested in this style of deck, I might take a look at that. I think it was just white-blue, but it was playing Refurbishes and it seemed a little more cohesive to me. Speaking of white-blue, let's go on to our next deck, which is uh, blue-white. Uh, this has Second Sun as the name, but I, I like to call it blue-white approach. Um, this deck is making a comeback online. I kind of, for our $5 or more per month patrons, we have, um, a special Facebook group called Constructed Critics, and I posted my thoughts on standard as well as the deck list that I'm trying for GP Portland before the Pro Tour, and one of the things that I talked about is I, I believe that this deck is going to have a resurgence. The reason for that is that, is that as things like blue-black control fall off the metagame, it means that there's still room for the fact that these decks are good, right? Like, Fumigate is good in this metagame. Uh, counterspells, whether it's Essence Scatter, whether it's Supreme Will, whether it's Sensor... Like, Counterspells in general in a, and Settle to the Wreckage and Fumigate, like, are good in a form of people trying to play to the board. And because of that, I believe that this deck will have a resurgence, and it already is doing that online. Yeah, I think this deck makes sense as a metagame call. Um, if you're playing other control decks, I just don't think you can actually play this deck because the matchups right. are horrible. Exactly. Um, and as, as Blue Black drops off, this deck comes up. As Blue Black comes in, this deck falls back down. Right. It's... So this deck has very clear good matchups and Predators. And, I mean, that for better or worse, you, you know what you're signing up for, right? Yeah. You you know what this deck is, and if you're playing against like Teamer and Tokens, you're gonna be really happy. The pure aggro matchups are probably not quite as good, but probably still okay. And the pure control matchups are awful. Coming up next, we have Rum and Up Red on the Moto Meta game. We have the list in front of us for Sam Dog MTG, huge MTGO grinder. We all know of this person uh, if you're familiar with the MTGO Meta game. But his list, I think, is, like, literally four or five cards off from the list that I did just either did a YouTube video on or posted to our critics group. Uh, this list is insane. This is exactly what I want to be doing in this deck. Yeah, I, I think that the uh, th this list, it makes sense to me. Just fundamentally, when I look at this list... I understand what he's trying to beat, what he's trying to do. Um, I really like the main deck Harsh Mentors and Rampaging Ferocidons. I like trimming on Oncrop Crasher a little bit. I might even trim more than he has, but the list is like really clean, really simple, but the the metagame calls just make sense. Yeah, I, I when I talk, I think, I feel like I did a deck tech. I'm like not 100% sure right now. 
But I kind of talked about Harsh Mentor and Ferostan in the main. Uh, cutting down a little bit on Ferostan uh, or Crasher. To me, the first thing that I would cut is the third uh, Skyship Raider. I feel like that card is the card that I always lose games because I draw too many of them. Yeah, I've usually played two carry Zevs in mono red, but yeah. it, the first one is extremely powerful. So yeah, it is, it is. I, I think that's it, a, a a standard point of contention, and I oh, feel like is more preference than one is strictly better or worse. So in my opinion, carry Zev is only as good as the on card crasher that comes after it. So one of the things that happens in this deck really often is it's impossible to block this deck. And we kind of talked about that during our deck of the week segment last week, but Carrie Zev actually adds to that because if you want to stop the two two from coming next turn, you have to block her. She has menace, and, and then there's and you can't block with an X one. Exactly, and on car crasher, uh, uh, ether or earthbound Kenra, Earth, is that Earth Shaker, Earth Earth Shaker, Shaker yeah. Kendra. They're all adding to the fact of this. So I do think that he's optimizing his deck between uh, Rampage and Frost on Wizard of Menace, uh, Hazrats, Crashers, Skyship Raiders. Like, it's very hard to block this deck. Yeah, I, I think I think that moving it in this direction, like in a, in a vehicles and token centra, centric metagame makes a lot of sense. Um, Harsh Mentor and Rampage and Frost are both pretty good against Teamer. Uh, but Harsh Mentor is also very good against your opponent trying to crew Heart of Kirin, for example. Um, trying to crew Aether Sphere Harvester. I, I, I just think this this deck makes sense to me. And I, I really like the exact choices. I mean, Aether Sphere Harvester especially, like, loses lifelink effectively. Right? Yeah. It, 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 like, un, it has negative lifelink when you play Harsh Mentor. That's really powerful. Let's go on to our number one deck, which is Team Air Energy. I don't think that surprises anybody, but I want to talk about a few things in the list in front of us. So we have a one of Carnage Tyrant main. We have a one of Sky Sovereign main, one of Supreme Will main. I think that the split between a one of Epson Scatter and a one of Abrade is pretty normal. I think that the number of Chandra's and the number of Confiscation Qs kind of goes in flux for a lot of people. But I want to start with you with kind of where this deck sits right now. I think it's the best deck in the meta. I think that people are finding ways to not have to play black. But uh, I know that a few pros talked about how much they hated Chandra in the mirror. And the only match that I lost at the PTQ, I played against Teamer three times at the PTQ in uh, Portland. And the only time I lost was to Chandra. Like the only games I lost in the mirror were to Chandra. And I think that people are cutting back on their Chandra hate, quote unquote. And because of that, Chandra is gaining back momentum in the mirror. I, especially when they're cutting back on bristling hydras, which so many decks are doing. Yeah, I think maybe less bristling. It's sort of cyclical, right? More confiscation coups, more essence scatters, more viziers of many faces, more less bristling hydras, all bode well for Chandra. Yes. Um, but I, I think one of the biggest struggles with this deck specifically, and one of the things I'll be really interested to see at the Pro Tour, is what ends up being most successful in terms of... One, one of my issues with this deck in general is that I feel like the changes you want to make to the deck for the mirror are almost inverse of what, what sort of setup you'd like for like aggressive matchups. Yeah. So I feel like you almost have to either punt game one in the mirror or punt game one in the I aggro agree. matchups. And that makes it a really challenging deck to build. This I think that this deck is that extremely I powerful. I agree. I think this is the reason that I hate Boat. Like, I had Boat in my early versions of this deck too, and I just cannot stand it. One it's of things... really bad if your opponent is playing a bunch of Confiscation Coups. Yeah. One of the things that I really like in both aggro control, like in all of the matches, right? Aggro control and mid range is actually the, he has the, the Ronos in his sideboard. One of the things that really helped me in the mirror match this weekend was actually my Ronus in the main deck. I'd play Ronus and my opponents would be like, oh my goodness. I don't actually know how I beat this. And against the aggro decks, they actually can't kill it. It blocks Hazarets. That, that has been something that's really good for me. Uh, you know, with Long Tusk Cub being such a huge part of this deck at this point. 
Yeah, it's interesting. There are just a lot of different ways you can kind of break serve in the mirror, uh, be it essence scatter. Uh, you know, it's sort of like your mix of I, but like I think the four, the, the four, the eight slots everybody, right? in this. Right, but there are about nine slots in this deck in this deck that you can mess with. And I think that's the Carnage Tyrant, the Essence Scatter, the Abrade, the Supreme Will, the Sky Sovereign, the two Chandras, and the two Confiscation Coups. I, I, Basically, I think, they're locked into playing at least what you have of everything else. I think two Glorybringers right. feels like about the minimum. Uh, I agree with that. I don't think that you're locked on four Willer. I think that you are locked on an Essence Scatter. Okay, you but so, so, you think, so you think you roughly, but roughly nine slots. Uh, which seems insane. One, that sounds like so many, right? It does seem like so. So let me let me count really quick. So one, two, three, four, five. I have five flex slots. Well, I'm cutting both Chandra's. Yeah, I because... think that you have to at this point because of the way the metagame shift. There has to be at least one Chandra in your main. Um, okay. So, so I mean, but maybe it's six slots. So we're pretty okay. close still. But that's a lot of slots for a consensus you know, best deck. Abzan never is, had anywhere it, near that many oh, flex slots. Completely Rally, agree. not yeah. even close. Most of these decks are just so much tighter than this. And it puts you in this really weird position where, like, having so many choices in deck building and not just sideboarding, but, like, in what cards do I include in the main deck and what matchups do I prioritize? It's really interesting because going into a pro tour with this deck, if you say... I want to beat aggro decks, and then you play three mirrors in a row, and they're playing Vizier of Many Faces, you know, double Essence Scatter, double conf or double Confiscation Coup in the main, and you just get wrecked. You're you're gonna feel really bad, right? It's it's very challenging to build this deck perfectly for a metagame. Yeah, one of the things that I think that is also interesting with Teamer, I kind of talked about. Casey was telling me that he wanted to play some PPTQs this weekend, and one of the things that I think is really important is that. I actually don't think that Teamer has a good sideboard, and I think that the sideboard is where you gain your edge with Teamer, and you have to get a little bit lucky to do it. And one of the reasons that I believe that is that, you know, uh, River's Rebuke is a good example of this, right? Where it's like, it is good in one single matchup, maybe the mirror. And you have to understand, like, what do I expect to play against? You probably have a lot of mirror matches. You probably have a lot of specific things depending on your metagame. And for me, I I find it really hard to sideboard for this deck. And I think that the reason is because I actually think that depending on what your opponent decides the correct game plan with Teamer is in the mirror match, as well as how their game plan is with mono red, with tokens, and with control, you should sideboard differently on the play and on the draw depending on what they've decided the matchup is about. That's just, that's difficult. It's so hard. Yeah, I mean, I just think this mirror is like, so it's simultaneously challenging and stupid. It's challenging until one of you draws like, you know, triple running glory bringer and the game isn't even sort of close. But you'll play these like really interesting grindy games. But I think the, the mind game part of it is often more interesting than the actual gameplay. Right, it reminds me a lot of this draft format sometimes. It's like really hard to interact, but your choices matter a lot. But a lot of your choices are made in what list you register. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, the deck is really powerful, but how exactly do you build it is a really tough question, and it's different every week. And I also think that having a flexible sideboard in this deck is more powerful than in any deck I might have ever seen in Standard Magic. Yeah, I mean, you can probably beat anything, but you can't beat everything. I agree. Let's go on. Uh, that's it for our power rankings. Michael, what would you play in standard? Uh, you don't have to answer if you don't want. It's tough. Like, if I were, if I were going to play a PPTQ this weekend, I really think that playing Teamer makes a lot of sense. I really think that if you believe you can play good, clean magic and you know what the people around you like to play, you can make choices that make you favored in any matchups you choose to be favored in. I think that's really powerful. Yeah, I posted two deck lists, kind of where I'm at in standard right now, uh, and they're both energy decks. I think that 
uh, teamer splashing black is where I'm at. The reason for that is um, I, I think that Varaska is actually a little bit underrated in a lot of matchups right now, and I actually want to be playing that card in my 75 somewhere. Uh, but I think that your total 75 in teamer gives you a huge edge if you understand what you're going to go up against and you have a plan. And then the other deck is uh, much more synergistic and proactive. Um, I'm a huge fan of Soul Tie Energy without Hostage Taker right now. Um, I actually played against a Soul Tie Energy without Hostage Taker from one of our listeners. I, 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 at least I didn't see Hostage Taker. And I, I think that that deck, whether you are playing Snake or not, I think that those colors are really good in this format right now. Um, I think Virtus Gearhulk is a huge part of it. So those are the kind of two decks that I'm on. And I think that Standard is in a good place. I think that people are really worried because of Team or Energy. But I, uh, this is often true when a quote-unquote mid-range deck is the best deck, is it kind of evens the format out, right? Like it goes up and down and between one and three the entire format, right? but other decks still spike and go. It actually keeps the format open when you really think about it. At the end of the day, teamer's going to be between one and three, depending on how it's built that week, but other decks can go up and down all the way through. Definitely, definitely. I think other decks are just more depending on the metagame, whereas teamer's more depending on exactly just the card choices you make. Exactly. Well, let's uh, let's go into our next segment, which is our training grounds. Every week we're going to talk about on the show. Uh, every week we want to be talking about like something that's going to try and make you better at Magic the Gathering. And today we want to talk about the power and the setbacks of comfort in Magic, the things that we are trying to do all the time uh, to make ourselves more comfortable and to make ourselves less comfortable. Sometimes comfort is good, sometimes it's bad, and we want to kind of just break down overall comfort in Magic. So. Let's talk about the first thing. Why is being comfortable so great? Michael, you and I both love sweatshorts. Why are sweatshorts so great? Who doesn't? I mean, really, if, if you say you don't, you're probably lying to yourself. Uh, you, never, you just never put on a pair of sweatshorts. Yeah, it's, it's a good time. It really just is. Uh, but being comfortable in Magic is great because I think it's easier to... Sometimes it's easier to think your best when you are relaxed and just sort of composed mentally. I think it's easy to slow down, not get wrapped up in what's happening or in being stressed out about the situation and just kind of slow down and just play. I mean, we're, we're playing a game, right? Yeah, I, I think that, like, when I think about being comfortable, I think about the fact that, like, like I, I really think about, like, maybe ramp style decks for is a good example of this for me where it's like i know exactly what my sequencing is supposed to look like according to my deck and when i think about that in a magic context it's like it's so much lifted off my shoulders where i know what i have to do and i think that when i think about the dangers of becoming comfortable it's like man i just haven't played a match out of the same sequencing or like the same 72 choices or the same hundred choices in a long time. So if I have to make a decision outside of those hundred or 200 choices, like what am I going to do? I don't know. Yeah. I, I think that makes sense. Like I was talking to Matt about this earlier today, but I was saying, I think one of the things that can happen sometimes if you play a lot but aren't necessarily challenging yourself a lot is that you can sort of build heuristics that don't necessarily work against the best players you play against. And yeah. you can get into these sort of like, okay, well, I try to bait him into doing this, but you end up being kind of, you just end up being kind of transparent against the really great players you play against sometimes. And, and I think that you kind of touched on my next point of the dangers of comfort, which is it's so easily get stuck on autopilot mode, right? Like you play X number of matches against your friends or X number of magics of magic online matches. 
And what happens is you're so used to those specific players that you think that everybody thinks that way. You think everybody's going to react the way that that person or those people are reacting. That you kind of get into a mode where you're not really thinking ahead. You're just thinking of what you've done in the past. Right, exactly. That it's turn four, so I play my Bristling Hydra. But why do I, like, is this necessarily, like, it? you know, use all my mana or whatever, but is it actually better than playing a Rogue Refiner? What does my opponent have? Why do I make this play, right? And I, I think that just generally, most of the best players I know are good at trying to win the game that's in front of them rather than trying to, like, obey sort of fundamental tenets of magic. And that as you improve... And you don't need to be told, hey, you should play your four drop on four. You start realizing that those things aren't necessarily always true, right? Yeah. Like, you, you, there are times where you have to try to make strange or maybe even bad plays because they are the only ones that give you a chance to win. Yeah. And it's not even just about, like, what, what is the most effective play for my deck, but it's what's the most effective play in this moment. Right, right, exactly. What could my opponent have? Why are they playing the way they're playing? You know, just just trying to be more, more thoughtful while you're playing Magic can some it can sometimes be difficult to find the line between that and staying relaxed. Let's talk about something that everybody suffers with when it comes to comfort in Magic, and that's kind of deck selection. So, let me let me just give my opinion, Michael, and then you can kind of counter or add to it. Sure. I think that so often magic players will like do well with a deck and they'll just jam again. Maybe they'll change two cards, maybe they'll change zero cards. But what happens is they're so used to playing a specific archetype or they're so used to playing a specific strategy that they don't actually care what the metagame looks like. They think that playing the same strategy a thousand times gives them the best chance to win. When, in my opinion, in reality, what actually gives you the best chance to win is just having some kind of a plan dependent upon what you expect. And if you're a little bit wrong, that's okay because you have a better plan than your opponent. But if you think that like you can just play ad nauseum a thousand times in modern because ad nauseum has a good matchup against the top three decks, but the, but what you thought were the top three decks aren't actually good right now. Like you should probably not be playing ad nauseum and just because you're comfortable with it and know all of the linear lines doesn't mean that it's correct. And I think that you have to balance that very carefully. Yeah, I think a lot of the time people think, sometimes I think people think switching decks is sort of maximizing short-term value at the expense of long-term value. But I sort of think about this the other way. Like people think, oh, I can become great with a deck and then it'll always be good. And while it's true that you'll rarely bomb out with a deck that you know inside and out, Sometimes you'll also be essentially playing unwinnable magic because other people will have adapted to metagame shifts and you'll be playing the same 75 from a couple of weeks ago. A good, um, uh, I'd like to add to your point, actually, that when you do it that way, you are locking yourself onto a cap, right? Like, you are saying that I am locked at a minimum of X, right? But I think that a lot of the time, that also maximizes your Y. Like you don't actually have a maximum that you thought that you had when you first started playing the deck. What you're actually trying to do is re reduce your X, you know, your X, Y, right? So you're trying to reduce the, when you look at your record, you're trying to reduce the no total number of losses rather than increasing your total number of wins, which can sometimes be costly if you're wrong. I think I, that kind of makes sense to me. I, I think ultimately trying to develop range is a really important thing especially if you play a lot of standard because the same kinds of decks aren't necessarily good format to uh, week to week let alone format to format right if you decide that all you can play is team or energy then and all you're going to play is team or energy and you're just going to update it i mean i think that that deck is probably good enough that you're going to be relatively successful doing that but I think that rather than deciding you're going to play Team or Energy and then making choices from there, you should sort of flip that backwards, right? So what cards do I want to be playing? Where do I want to be in matchups? And if it indicates to you that the correct, if, if, that, if that sort of decision-making indicates that Team or Energy is the best choice, 
then great, play team or energy. But if that leaves you leaning towards something else, it's really valuable to be comfortable enough with playing different decks to be able to make a switch. Where do you think that it's like when you fall victim to comfort, how do you know that you're too comfortable? Where like when do you realize like, oh, you know what the problem is, is that I'm kind of on autopilot. I kind of didn't think about this event at all. Like, how do you recognize that? So sometimes with an event, like it's a format that you play a fair amount. Like it might be a modern event and you're just like, well, this is my modern deck. Um, and I mean, sometimes like financially, you just only own one modern deck, but maybe it's, you don't really think about your sideboard cards, the event. This is just the 75 you always play, right? Or oh. stuff, stuff like that, where you're just, you like your deck, you mostly like it, but instead of thinking about why it would be good this week, we're just playing it because we're fairly good with it. So is, does that, is that just come back to like constant reflection and that hashtag always improving? Or does that come to something else? I think that's a big part of it. But I, I think that you just, you sort of need a, a lot of people, and I struggle with this too sometimes, I need to remind myself constantly to examine, to, to sort of flip flip the process. Rather than deciding on a deck and then trying to build it to be good against the metagame, you want to look at the metagame and then decide on a deck. Like, I, I think it just makes so much more sense to sort of work in reverse. Can you expand on that a little bit? So my hope is that I can develop enough range as a player that I don't feel that all I can do is play four variants of team or energy so I can change the main inside, but I, like, won't play tokens or whatever, right? Where I might say, oh, well, I think this week I need this card in the main deck and this card in the main deck and this card in the main deck because I expect these matchups. But what you've done when you're doing that is you're already deciding you're going to play team or energy. You're already deciding that that's the deck for you before you've examined if it actually makes sense to be playing team or energy at that point. So, Michael, let's let's kind of flip this a little bit. When is being comfortable favorable for you? And I'll kind of let you go first on this one. So I'm someone who kind of struggles with stress levels related to, like, an anxiety disorder during events and being comfortable like in an event uh in being conversational with my opponent in sort of just like making magic fun rather than stressful makes being comfortable i think generally really favorable for my ability to play well um but i think it's maybe finding it's easy to want to be comfortable so much that you become lazy. Okay. That doesn't sound like a favorable part of it. So I think being favorable, but it, it's really favorable in the sense that you, you want to, I, for me personally, it's very important that I'm comfortable like physically and mentally during an event sure. because I play poorly when I find myself under, under stress that is more than what the game itself is inducing. Yeah. I, I think that for me, like, if there's a favorable part of being comfortable, it's that you you relieve stress from the mundane parts of magic. And I think that that comes through things that people don't think it comes from. So too often people think that being comfortable means knowing your deck, knowing X, knowing Y. But I think that what it actually comes from, and those things actually come from a subsect that people don't appreciate. Knowing your deck is because you play tested. Knowing your deck, knowing your matchups is because you play testing. The, your preparation actually leads to the comfort. Saying that I don't need to prepare because I know my deck, it's not the same thing of I know my deck because I prepared. And I think that people right. switch those. I think that's totally true, and that's what I was trying to get at with deck selection, right? That if you get those flipped, you end up feeling comfortable because you're not trying to – you're making things too easy for yourself – rather than having pre-done the work that you need to. Exactly. You have to do it in the right order, not flip it because it's easy. Easy isn't important here. What's important is, you know, too often Magic players, everything is an investment to them, right? Time, money, everything. And what the truth is, is that depending on what your goals are, you have to adjust your investment according to what you want and comfort is part of that. 
you can't overlook the fact that maybe you have to get a little bit uncomfortable to get comfortable. Yeah, I, I like that as a point where you build comfort through – you like build an ability to be confident and comfortable through putting yourself through uncomfortable situations, through honest self-reflection, reflection on deck choices, reflection on your habits around tournaments and practice. And I think that like – in general, you have a lot of control over how comfortable you feel, and it's not always just deciding. It's not always as simple as just deciding you're going to be comfortable. Exactly. Because at the end of the day, you can be wrong about how comfortable you are, whereas if you just put in the correct work and make the correct decisions, the comfort kind of comes along with it. And the comfort is an advantage, right? Like if you understand how to sideboard, you understand what your matchups look like, all those things, that causes comfort throughout a tournament that you didn't you didn't get from deciding you were comfortable. You got it through other means. It, yeah, that's true. And I think that sort of separating how you would like, because for me, when I think of comfort, I think a lot of like calming my nerves. And sometimes that's something I have to do acutely, but sometimes that's something like if you're playing a big match, it's natural to feel pressure. And I think that, understanding that it's okay to be a little uncomfortable when it's because you're excited about what you're playing for, right? That's a good kind of discomfort. That's, that's a sign that what you're, that you are invested in what you're doing and sort of separating that from the kind of discomfort that you get from lack of preparedness. Exactly. They're different things and it's important to know that. So that's it for the training grounds this week. Thank you so much, Michael. This was a really fun training grounds for me and I hope that the listeners enjoyed it. Don't forget to check us out on patreon.com slash ccmtg to become a patron of the show and limited time only. Check it out, patreon.com slash ccmtg. Starting at $1 or more per month, anything that you see that is really appreciated. Um, I know that one of our listeners uh, was talk at the GB was talking to us. He's like, the second I win money at a Grand Prix, I'm going to become a patron and because I want to give back to you guys. And that's kind of the goal, right? Like, we want to get you enough value that you feel like you can give back to us. It's not about – I don't think that Michael or I are doing this to make money. Like, I enjoy talking to Michael about magic. And yeah, I mean, it's for fun, right? I yeah, mean, exactly. It's for fun. It helps us get better. We hope it exactly. helps you get better. It, it forces me to put myself in a situation to get better. And if it's getting you better and it's getting you value, we just hope you give us a little bit of a kickback because – you know, it, it's fun, but, like, we keep it free because we want it to be free. So patreon.com slash ccmtg. Michael, if people want to talk to you about uh, the fact that you can't seem to get good tiebreakers and have to take 17th place at GPs, where can they get a hold of you? Uh, you can find me on Facebook. My name is Michael Handrocker. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at MagicMikeMTG. Yeah, if you want to find me not dream-crushing people, you can do that at uh, spencer 13 h uh, on Twitter and Spencer Stephen Howell on Facebook. You can find me in the Constructed Critics Facebook group. Uh, if you're a patron of Five Dollars or More, Constructed Criticism family. If you are just a listener of the show, we have tons of people in there that are awesome. Uh, you can join the Discord channel on Disc. Uh, you can find the Discord link, the Facebook link, all of the links uh, right on the. Uh, Mason is like calling you out in chat right now. We'll we'll uh, get there. He also tweeted about it, so we're we're oh, gonna okay. get there. Okay. Uh, so you can find all the links on constructivism.com if you click on the, uh, oh man, I'm like spacing it. I think it's the bios section. Anyway, the description or bio section, you can find all the links there. You can join the clan by messaging me on, uh, MDGO at Spencer the King Dev, and you can tweet at us with hashtag would that be good. Hashtag would that be good is our Twitter outreach program. If you tweet it, we'll read it on the show. We want to talk about the things that help you get better at Match the Gathering and maybe make your pizza a little bit better. Yeah, um, man. The first one this week is from Andrew Elliott, who says, wide awake at 2 a.m. and can't sleep, watching the Enter the Battlefield documentary at Walk the Plains and Co. are great. Hashtag would that be good. Yeah, I, I do like those documentaries. I do a lot, too. Oh, and actually Nathan Holt, who I think I believe produced it or directed it, replied to him and thanked him for enjoying it, which I think is awesome. That's cool. Uh, but I like those a lot, and my parents discovered them on Netflix and watched them, and I think it gave them That's sort cool. of an – they gave them sort of an appreciation for what people might like about magic. Yeah. Um, let's go on to our next one, which is also Andrew's or, – or no, I guess it's me. Yeah, so if you're a patron, we actually do upcoming episodes voting – 
So it lets you actually pick the training ground. So if you're a patron of $1 per month, anything, you do get a help vote on upcoming episodes. This one is special. And that's fun. That's helpful for us, too, because it, it helps is. us produce content that you want to hear. That's exactly. that's something that I really want to encourage people to do. Uh, it, it actually makes it easier on us because sometimes there are a lot of things that you could talk about, and it's hard to decide which one you're really feeling into this week. And just having someone else say, hey, this is something I want to hear about is really positive. Yeah, I completely agree. It's really helpful for us. So thank you so much. Um, Andrew says, going to start writing in a bi-weekly basis. Have any topics you want covered? I wanted to talk about why Eldrazi Tron is the worst deck in Modern. Uh, and how it qualified you for a Pro Tour after your RPTQ. Oh! Uh, if you could unban one rare in Modern, what would be why? Me, Twin, I think the format can handle it now. Uh, is Birthing Potter rare? Because I'm pretty sure it is, and it has actually no reason to be banned. Uh, I just want to unban Jace, just to play that's, with it more. That's a Mythic. Eh, Mythic is like it's like square and rectangle. They're subsets. No, you, I. Okay, so Mason says oh, that I am allowed then, to say Mythic, so I'm going to vote Jace. Well, then I would also vote Jace. Sweet, I, we're but, in agreement. But, but also, I don't think that Jace, Bloodbird Elf, or Pod, any of them have a reason to be banned. Sure. I think that people just whine. Yeah, like, in, in general, none of those cards actually should be banned. I think Jace, in general, would allow for better reactive decks, and I think that that's something that would make Modern a better format, generally. Yeah, me too. Uh, if you want CCMTG wristband, come with BGB Phoenix. I literally had these in my backpack, and nobody asked for one, and I forgot. So if you came up and didn't get one, I'm so sorry. I gave them to, like, two people, because I remembered, but I, uh, I met more listeners at this Grand Prix than any other Grand Prix before, and I just... I was floored. I really appreciated it. So, thank you. Uh, I fell, Mason and Spencer, need, I fe, uh, it's probably supposed to say felt, need a relationship counseling because of this. Please stop glorifying toxic relationships, couples, costumes, idea, uh, pizza, and pineapple. So, uh, we'll get to that a little bit later, Scotty, because I tweeted something uh, as well. Using shapers of nature to pump my opponent's lightning rig so I can leech in judgment. <laughs> Hashtag, would that be good? I mean, that sounds like a really interesting game of limited. I'm down for that. If I got to, if I, four counters on your opponent's lightning rig, lightning, lightning rig crew is, that's dedication to the idea. Yeah. That's, that's a lot. Uh, this dinner wasn't real. Dude, I had so much good food in Phoenix. Uh, I, I usually post, uh, stuff on Instagram and stuff. If you want to check that out, uh, it's pretty great. Feeling good about standard PPTQ tomorrow. Approach seems super consistent. Uh, let me let let's make it back to back wins. I actually do think that approach is better in standard right now than it's been since like week four of the format. Like yeah, people are really off blue black right now. Yeah. Uh, good luck to my hashtag Nashville soft brothers today in Comex City two. Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm happy to see this Nashville crowd that is a fan of the show doing well. So. Just throwing a thank you to Spencer through Nate for making the world a better place. I feel like he doesn't uh, appreciate how much he does. Um, so I, I I suffer from depression. So if I ever come across ungrateful or that people don't appreciate me, I'm I'm sorry. Um, I I don't think I do as much as some Magic players give me credit for. I always feel like I could be doing more. Like. Almost there's, by definition, that's true. There's yeah, like I, I, I appreciate yeah. the sentiment. I really do, but I always want to be improving and be doing more for the community. But thank you so much, Scotty. That means the world. Uh, why don't you read the next one, Michael? All right, these are my favorite six letters. Easy BBGG. Hashtag would that be good? And it's a picture of Alex Sittner making out a ten thousand dollar check to himself. Alex Sittner, the owner of Oasis Games for winning the unrivaled world championship of villagers and villains which is cool what is villagers and villains uh well i mean i, I don't want to talk crap about a board game that alex won ten thousand dollars playing but it's a board game that probably isn't that interesting Maybe but alex is apparently graded it so yeah, not you know. to win ten thousand dollars so 
I Mason, mean, why don't you go ahead and read the next one? Oh, I have to unmute myself and do everything, but now they can hear me. Uh, at Magic Mike MTG, the true heel we need in Magic. What? Well, uh, that's uh, oh, is that good. is that not it? Oh, I, I'm not actually following along. I assumed it was my tweet. Which one? I don't. Uh, I don't follow this along. You, this it. is you tweeting a picture. Oh, I, 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 I actually tweet don't a picture? see the heel tweet. What is the heel tweet about? Well, we'll we'll get there when we get there. <laughs> uh, so this what? is Mason tweeting the the lingering souls announcement uh, with oh. me and Danny and uh, Alex. Being okay. Tweeted out was on that team. Uh, so that's something we're really excited about. Uh, so yeah, do you want to give a shout out to that sponsor? Or... Yeah, so basically the guy who sponsors the team does a lot of other stuff related to gaming. We'll probably have more information at some point soon. Uh, we'll likely be doing a little bit of content for him, and as that becomes available, I will be happy to like link it in the Facebook group, stuff like that. Uh, so just, just stay tuned on that one. Will you sign my Lingering Souls? I mean, <laughs> if you really want. I mean, I just asked you, so I, I think I okay. want Okay. All right. All right. Good. And I want Danny to sign him, too. I'm going to get him on that. Sometimes Perfect. you must join with your enemy to defeat the true villain. At SOV Mason, I call upon you. Hashtag whether be good. And this is a pizza with strawberries on it. Yeah, that's just, you know. It's just wrong. This is the most evil thing in existence. Someone I, tweeted something else that was pretty bad. It was candy corn, but this is worse. So, like, I love strawberries, like, a lot. They're, the, like, legitimately my favorite thing in the world. And this is pure evil. Yeah, yeah strawberries on pizza is just weird. That Bourbon, doesn't sound good. Yeah, so we'll join forces. I don't care about this pineapple anymore. We must put an end to this strawberries on pizza bullcrap. Andrew says, Birthing Pod has no reason to be banned. Unsubs from podcast resends Patreon account. <laughs> Hashtag with it be good. Uh, yeah, I'm going to stand by that. You can unsub all you want. Like, <laughs> like, Birthing Pod was just a consistent deck that people whined about. It actually was never too good. You could beat it with so many different decks. Like, so many including Eldrazi Tron would probably wipe the floor with it. So I don't know why you would care. Uh, like, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. So Mason, Mason's tweet that he thought he was reading was basically calling me out for accidentally dream crushing my round 15 opponent. Tell so, us about that. so I'm in the X three pod, right? So like I was seven, two day one, I two in my first draft with a pile that I thought I was going to O three with. So that was, that was pretty nice, you know, but I'm an X three pod. So I assume everyone's X three not really paying attention. I win my first two rounds, and then I'm in the final. And I sit down, say hey to the guy I'm playing against. We're, you know, we shuffle up. The judge drops off the match slip. He tucks the match slip in, you know, the table or whatever. I don't I don't look at it. We play the match. I win. It's pretty close, but I win. Uh, and he fills out the match slip and signs it, then hands it to me as a judge is coming up and saying, hey, can I take that from you? And he says, at this point, the first time, so we've been, we've talked throughout the entire match, and he says, oh, man, that's really too bad. I really wanted to win that one. I thought, I thought I was going to top eight. And he's X2, but never told me that he was X2 and never asked for a concession at any point until this, uh, never mentioned this until the slip was in the judge's hand. Well, and I just felt horrible, because, like, I would have been happy to concede had he, you magic. know. Magic Mike, I gotta tell you, man, you're a little less magical to me today. So, thank you, everybody, for listening, and we'll see you guys all next week. See ya.